This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Ogma. It is late, and the crowd here at Waterdeep's Yawning Portal Inn has been thinning. Only a few bleary-eyed souls, hardened drunks, and folks who have a room upstairs and nowhere to be in the morning remain. The dark-haired half-elf who has been sitting in the corner, plucking out tunes on his mandolin, rises and shoulders the fine instrument. You see a sinuous silver line emblazoned on his royal blue jerkin like a badge. Thank you all, he says to those that remain, for your kind attention and your even kinder coin. He rattles his cap, jingling the sizable collection of silver he's amassed. And praise to Ogma, the eloquent, for the gift of music I have been allowed to share this evening. The few conscious patrons grunt something like assent, and the minstrel heads upstairs. Let's play a game. What do the following words have in common? Azeth, Chanti, Gond, Helm, Mistra, Ogma, Shar, Torm, Uthgar, Joaquin. Well, if you're a Dungeons and Dragons fan who's ever played a game in the Forgotten Realms setting, you might have recognized some of those names. Or if you've ever read any of the Forgotten Realms novels, you might recognize a couple. And if you've ever played any of Black Isle Studios' old computer role-playing games like Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale, perhaps you've heard a few. Or if you've played other CRPGs, like Neverwinter Nights or Sword Coast Legends, they may have the Ring of the Familiar. They are all deities of the Forgotten Realms. Or they were at one time. Because in the history of Dungeons and Dragons, things got complicated, and some of them died or disappeared a few years ago. But then they got better. Maybe. Sort of. But one of the names on that list stands out. One of these names is not like the others. One of those names doesn't belong. Can you guess which name is not like the others by the time we finish this series of sentences? We're not singing. Shout out to the very old school Sesame Street fans who got the reference though. Remember that question, we'll come back to it. As popular as the Forgotten Realms is, that's right, it is a singular franchise, and we really wish creators would stop using plural words and titles because the subject-verb agreement drives us bonkers. We're looking at you, Gilmore Girls. Also, the canonically lowercase g in girls isn't funny either. But we digress. Recently, at a panel at Gamehole Con, Chris Perkins presented some official data gathered by Wizards of the Coast about what settings people use for their D&D games. And the results showed that 55% of the people responding play in homebrewed settings, 35% play in the Forgotten Realms, and 5% of gamers are diehards who won't let Greyhawk die. The remainder play in a setting called Other, which we've never heard of. Now, if you're new to Dungeons & Dragons, you might wonder what the heck we're going on about. The thing that confuses a lot of new people about D&D, and something we recently had to explain to a group of complete neophytes, is that Dungeons & Dragons isn't really a game. It's a game system. It allows you to play all sorts of games, but it's kind of like a play box or an X station. You can go out and buy different adventure modules and campaigns, and those are like the games you stick in your game console of choice. Or you can create your own. But that means everything is up for grabs, even the setting where the world takes place. Sure, D&D has a lot of basic assumptions built into it. Elves and dwarves exist, dragons exist, magic is a thing. An anachronistic soup of vaguely medieval European stuff exists. But sometimes some Renaissance stuff gets in there, and stuff from Asia and the Middle East and Mesoamerica and Africa slosh in 
And hell, pre-common era influences from Greece to Persia to the Celts I'll get in too. It's a big mess we call fantasy. But beyond that, there's a lot of specific details you can swap in and out. For example, way back in the 1970s, the two creators of D&D, Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax, ran their own home games. Along the way, they invented their own settings, their own worlds, which we call campaign settings. Arneson's world was called Blackmoor, and Gary Gygax ran his games in the world of Greyhawk. Over time, certain Greyhawk elements became the default assumptions for the core game of D&D. Meanwhile, elements of Blackmoor disappeared forever because, apparently, Gary won. Then, another setting appeared. A very richly detailed fantasy setting, similar in some respects to Greyhawk, but much bigger and much more complicated. And strangely enough, it was written before D&D even existed. It was called The Forgotten Realms. In the mid-1960s, a young man, and we mean really young, like eight years old, started making up fantasy stories, like kids do. But his stories built on each other and took place all in the same world. And this kid grew up to become game designer Ed Greenwood. According to Greenwood, the world he called Abertoral was one Earth-like planet in a multiverse of Earth-like planets existing alongside Earth. Most of the stories in the Forgotten Realms take place on the continent of Faerun. When Greenwood became enamored of Dungeons and Dragons in the mid-70s, shortly after it was invented, he started using his childhood fantasy world as the setting for his adventures. His players appreciated the rich detail and complexity of the world. Detail and complexity which, by that point, he'd had a decade to build. In 1979, he started publishing articles describing the lands of Faerun and Eber Toril in Dragon Magazine articles. When, in 1987, TSR was getting ready to release a new edition of D&D, that would be Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition, although it wouldn't come out until two years later. When TSR was gearing up for the new edition, they started looking around for a new setting for D&D, and they contacted Greenwood. Greenwood apparently sent them all of his notes and maps for the setting and sold TSR all of the rights. Later though, Greenwood noted that TSR had made some changes. For example, they had removed the concept of a multiverse of alternate Earths and the idea that Abertoro was a world we could travel to. Though planar travel and magical portals did remain a very strong element in the setting. In 1987, TSR released the Grey Box. It was a big cardboard box with maps and books, a complete guide to the Forgotten Realms, a world in a box. It was popular enough. But what really made the setting take off was when, in 1988, R.A. Salvatore published The Crystal Shard. This was the first novel to feature the reformed dark elf Dritzt Duerden. What had happened was that TSR was looking for an author to write some books for their new setting, and Salvatore won the chance. His Icewind Dale trilogy, and especially his character Dritzt, were breakout hits. From that point on, The Forgotten Realms was a fixture on game store shelves. Although it wouldn't be considered D&D's default setting until 5th edition, Forgotten Realms sourcebooks and materials were released pretty much continuously throughout every edition since 2nd edition AD&D. It was the alternate setting. The setting you moved to after the generic D&D setting whetted your appetite and you wanted more world lore and details and maps and gods than the anemic offerings of the core books. However, we at the Word of the Week have to confess that we never got into the Forgotten Realms. The reason is much the same reason that we never really got into comics. It's just too daunting. There's so much lore, and so many details, and so many gods, and so many characters, you don't know where to begin. <laughs> 
One experience stands out particularly in our minds. We opened the Forgotten Realms campaign setting, a beautiful, massive 300-page tome released in 2001 for the third edition of D&D. And we found a four-page long list of the gods of the Forgotten Realms. The book was beautiful and it was richly detailed and filled with gorgeous maps and art. In general, Forgotten Realms products are beautiful products. But four pages of gods? Well, that's what happens when you're building on the same canon for basically 30 years. Yes, it's richly detailed and practically alive, but it's scary and unapproachable. It seems Wizards of the Coast, now publishers of D&D, also agreed that it was pretty scary. That's why they killed off dozens and dozens of gods and blew up half the worlds of Aber Toril by crashing Aber and Toril together and setting them on fire when it came time to release the fourth edition of D&D. But that move proved to be an unpopular and heavily criticized decision, so they sort of undid some of it when the fifth edition came out. However, that's a bit of supposition on our part because although numerous products have been released that are set in the Forgotten Realms, we're still waiting for the massive tone describing the Forgotten Realms by itself as a setting for adventure. That aside, one thing did stand out on that list of deities, one deity in particular, and that deity was Ogma. See, almost all the deities of the Forgotten Realms have gibberish names. They're just made up. But Ogma the god of wisdom, shares a name with a god from our world. Well, not a god, but someone who is often mistaken for a god and then gets conflated with one or more gods. It's complicated. In the Forgotten Realms version, Ogma was not a native deity of Toril. Instead, he was a god that a bunch of extraplanar refugees brought with them from another plane of existence. And he rose in power, and eventually became the god of knowledge, and invention, and bards. But in real-world mythology, Ogma was the champion of a mysterious group of refugees who came from another world and rose in power. And ultimately, Ogma got conflated with a smiling god of wisdom and oration. Coincidence? Maybe. But it's a weird coincidence. But it's almost weirder if it isn't a coincidence, because of all the hundreds of gods and mythological figures in the Forgotten Realms, why is Ogma just about the only carryover from our world? Weird, right? So who is Ogma in our mythology? Well, to answer that, we have to travel back to the misty shores of ancient Ireland to talk about the Tuatha de Danann. Who were they? Well there's a lot of confusion about that. They often get confused with gods, but they also have ties to the fairy folk of Ireland. And some have even suggested they were aliens, but not anyone who is taken very seriously. According to medieval Irish mythology, Ireland, the land of Era, had been invaded many times before it finally came to the people who would eventually call themselves the Irish people and the Tuatha de Danann were the second to last to make Ireland their home. At the time of their arrival, Ireland was ruled by the Firbolg, the men of bags. The Firbolg were descendants of previous settling tribes who were forced to flee Ireland to Greece. There, they were enslaved or oppressed until they once again fled. Eventually, they returned to Ireland carrying all of their possessions in heavy bags on their backs and their five chieftains divided the land of Ireland amongst them. One day, on the shore of Northern Ireland, the mists part and a new group of settlers arrive. They are the people of Danu, the Tuatha de Danann. Whether Danu was their goddess or was simply a great leader elevated to god status is hard to say. According to legend, these settlers burned their boats so that they could not flee back to whatever homeland they had come from. They came to stay, and they went to war with the Firbolg. The Tuatha de Danann were more skilled and civilized than the Firbolg, and they won the war. <laughs> 
Out of respect for the Firbolg, they allowed them to remain in parts of Northern Ireland, but claimed the rest of the land for themselves and conquered the rest of the peoples of Ireland. The people of Ireland were enamored of their new rulers, who were civilized and knowledgeable and who also had four great treasures. The Sword of Nuada would always kill when it struck, and the Stone of Fall would cry out if the true king of Ireland set foot on it. Yes, a magic sword and a magic stone that would help identify the true king of the land. That might sound a little familiar. They also had a magic slingshot that belonged to the sun god Lug. And finally, they had the cauldron of Dagda, which would produce an endless supply of food. Yes, a container that would basically keep you alive. Which also might sound familiar. These elements all found their way into the tales of King Arthur. Of course, some of the details were changed when Christianity took hold across the lands of Britain, and so the search for the lost cauldron of Dagda became the quest for the Holy Grail. But who was Ogma? Was Ogma, like Danu, one of the gods? No. Well, maybe. This is where things get unclear. Ogma was a champion of the Tuatha de Danann. He served in the war against the Firbolg, and he might have been forgotten if not for a lost arm and an evil king. See, the king of the Tuatha de Danann was a man named Nuada. During one of the final battles of the Firbolg, Nuada's arm is cut off. Because of that injury, being less than whole of body, Nuada is declared unfit to rule. In his place, a nasty piece of work named Bress takes over the throne. He's a terrible king, especially because he is descended from the Tuatha de Danann's mortal enemies, the Fomorians. Fortunately, Nuada gets a magical silver arm to replace his lost one, and he and Ogma team up to overthrow Bress and reclaim the throne. And this is where things become hazy. Remember how we said that the Tuatha de Danann were the second to last people to invade Ireland? Well, eventually, the final group of people show up. They were the Milesians, a Gaelic tribe from Western Europe, and they ousted the Tuatha de Danann. According to legend, the Tuatha de Danann were driven underground and became servants to the fairy folk of Ireland. Their title was Ace She people of the mounds. But the Milesian Gaels had a god, Ogmios. The trouble is, not too much is remembered about Ogmios. All we know is that he was a powerful deity. He was eloquent and wise, and he was a smiling god. He also, apparently, had the power to bind people to his will and to lead the dead across the afterlife. And gradually, Ogma, the mythical hero, and Ogmios, the god of eloquent wisdom, may have become one and the same, or may have at least had the same root. Incidentally, that's not the only bit of divine cross-contamination here, because the Tuatha de Danann have a god named Era, and the Milesians held onto that as the name of their land, the land of Era. So how can you use all of this in your game? Well, there's a lot here, and this is our longest word of the week yet. But there's some good fodder. First of all, there's the story potential and the idea of refugee people bringing their own gods with them. What does that mean in D&D, a world where all the gods are real? If people suddenly show up worshiping different gods, are they just different versions of the gods people already know? Are they gods forgotten in this portion of the world? Are they invader gods from other universes? False gods? There's a lot of cloth to work with here. Because when people travel, they bring a lot more than just their luggage. They bring their culture, their history, and their mythology. But there's also a good cautionary tale that deserves mentioning. If you, as a GM or a creator, want to bring people into your world, you've got to strike a balance between richness and approachability. If, like this episode, 
and the story of Ogma. Your world is so filled with complex details that it scares new people away? You might just have to crash a planet into it and set it on fire. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com. Thank you.